a good interaction and a lot of people in that estate or estates like it have faith in the guards. I think we need to look back to Limerick and the resources that were flung at Limerick when all this crime absolutely exploded, as you were saying. And the, the money went in, the resources went in. They need really just to shatter, our minister shatter needs to really rethink the whole thing and they need to put a lot of more resources into that to tackle it. I, I think there's, there's a couple of issues. First of all, as we, as Michael was saying there, because we're increasingly seeing the use of kind of small weapons, relatively small weapons, they're much easier to conceal mm -hmm. just at a basic level. So I think that creates another uh, challenge for the guys. But uh, the thing that I think in a sense has delivered in terms of falling crime rates in Limerick was that the initiatives around kind of early child intervention and juvenile justice and stuff that was aimed at, at kids was linked to the criminal justice responses. So the, the guards and the broader kind of social regeneration, as it was called, was linked up together. And, you know, there's been controversy about the way in which money was spent, but nevertheless, it has delivered in terms of falling crime rates. If we look at West Dublin, there has actually been a lot of money spent as well on, on early childhood interventions and projects. But I, I, maybe because of the, the, the spatial arrangements of West Dublin, I, I don't know if there's been the same linkage in terms of the criminal justice responses, and that may be an area to look at. Well, maybe, Michael, if I was just trying to put it into perspective, as I understand it, um, murders are down, but gun crime statistically is up. But no, gun crime is down. It's down, isn't yeah, it? Last year, uh, 16 people were, ki were killed in gun homicides. Now, they weren't all gangland. We've had four this year. Uh, one of them was not gangland, it was a, a horrible murder-suicide in, in the country. But the, in 2010 there were 23, so we saw in 2011 a 40% reduction in gun homicide. But that's no comfort to anybody. There are probably, I'd say probably about another 15 people alive tonight who by the end of this year will be dead. Statistically we're probably talking about 18, 19 people are going to be murdered by, by guns this year. So statistics are fine, but you know, we're talking about human tragedies and whether it's 19 people killed or 25 people killed or 14 people killed, it's still a difficult job for Gardaí. But just getting back to the point about policing, uh, two major areas for Gardaí in, gun, in gun, relation to gun crime were Fingless in North Dublin and Limerick. Uh, and in both those areas there was a significant addition of resources. And in, there were startling results. For example, in Fingless, in the year 2011, there wasn't one gun murder previously you were talking about four or five gun murders a year, so there, were, there was a detective inspector appointed for Fingus, there were extra detectives. But well, is that just containment as opposed to, you know, finding a long-term solution to the problem? You flood an area with, oh, yeah. with Gardaí, it solves the problem, but it's not a long-term solution. Well, and Gardaí will say, by the time the Gardaí are called, it's too late. That they are, they have to answer all the ills of society. So it's prevented the prevention. But the Guardi are called. It's far too late because they, they're I the think firefighters. Think, Alan, in the in the short term, having kind of more intensive policing presence, it does reassure local residents and it creates respite in a scenario where you have communities which are under extreme pressure. So even in that sense, even if it's only containment, if you're living in the middle of this containment, you could be very grateful for it. But Alan, oh, yeah. the, I mean, if you take it, there's one uh, Guardi station in Tallinn. There's four in Limerick, you know. That's resources that you're talking about. Tala has a population of in excess of 100,000 people. That's not Limerick, you know. It's similar, but they have four guard stations, so the resources are just multiplied. Okay. Well, well coming up on this new special, we're going to look at the human cost of gun crime and the thorny issue of gun control. to this TV3 news special on gun crime. Behind every crime statistic is a real person who has had to pay a terrible price. One innocent victim of gun crime is Maxine Southcliffe, whose partner, John O'Neill, was shot dead for no apparent reason. I wasn't in the bar that night. I was at home with the babies, and um, John went out at 10 past 11, quarter past 11 to meet the, a couple of the boys that were there from, from the wedding and um, he, he went and everything was fine he he, he kissed he kissed his goodbye I waved out the window at him he said make sure you lock that window because I don't want anyone to get those babies and then it was about I can't even remember what time it was I think it was about half past three or, it wasn't long after anyway my sister Olive rang my phone and I woke up I didn't know you know what, it was it was late it was dark she said, there's been an accident, you need to go to Coco's bar. And I said, what, an accident? She said, John's been shot. And I said, I think I actually cursed at her. I said, no way. 
She said, yeah, she said, you need to go hurry. And I just, at that moment, I just panicked. We got into a taxi and when I put, we, it felt like forever before the taxi got there, but it was only a matter of minutes. And when we pulled up in the taxi, I could just see an ambulance. And I thought, why is the ambulance still here? He needs to go to hospital. He's been shot. He needs to go. And I was running to go into Coco's bar because I needed to get to him, but she said, he's not in there. And I said, where is he? I need to go to him. And she said, he's actually, he's, um, he's up there. And I looked him. He's on the ground, under a sheet. And I, I said, please, I need to go to him. I need to just hold his hand. And they couldn't understand what I was saying, but they just kept saying no. And, and they kept saying, momentum, momentum. And I thought, well, OK, they're going to let me. So I sat in the pavement and I watched him. I could just see his arm. His arm was out like this. And then the guys came with the, right, the forensics, I think, in the white suits. And then when I saw them, I knew it, it was bad. And Sharon said, no, Sydney's dead. I said, no, he's not dead. I need to hold his hand. You know, I need to be there. And he needs me. He needs me to hold his hand. I said, no, he, he is. And then I don't know what happened at all. I just went in a blur. And, the police came and said, um, we're taking him. And I said, but I need, you told me I could be with him and I need to hold his hand. I need to tell him, I love him, I need to just hold his hand. And they, they said, no, he's going to go to the to the palace and he's going to be taken there and you can go there in the morning. And I couldn't understand what was what had just happened, you know. But then that was it. And in the meantime, we had to, I just had to wait. And every day I was told, no, you can't see him today. A week later it was nine days actually um, he was in the chapel arrest and um, they told when we got there he was he was laid out but it just didn't look like him it didn't look like John at all he looked completely different not like and I know I've seen people who are dead so but he just didn't look he looked like he was really hungry or something and then um, they told us that he was going to go on the next flight the next morning he was going home and I was just so glad to think that we were going home, that we were getting out of there, because I couldn't stay there another minute, you know. I just needed to go. And then I saw him, when we, when we came home, I went to see him in Jennings, and he looked completely different. He looked like, like the man that we knew. But it was just, I can't describe it, I can't describe the, the horror. The, it was a living nightmare, that's all I can say. It was a living nightmare. When, um... And I had to tell Jake, I had to tell Jake that um, he wanted to know where he was. And I thought, how am I going to tell him? I don't want to be the one to break his heart. Why do I have to do it? Why did, why did this have to happen? And I said, but I'm sorry, son. He's not coming back. What do you mean, he's not coming back? I said, he's dead, baby. He's dead and he's not coming back. And then that, that was when I realised, when I had to say the words to Jake, and I knew, and, the, uh, and I wanted to just die myself, and I know that's a terrible thing to say when you have two young babies, but it was just, I was torn while I was torn into, it was, it was hell. Jake talks about him all the time, every day. This is, he showed me how to use this tool, or, you know, and it was something that he had done. He remembers things all, all the time. I gave him a Valentine's card yesterday, and I put, I always put, from mum and dad, I always put our names on and he said, do you know what, that's the nicest card I ever got in my life, and he just looked up to, to the ceiling, thanks dad, and, and it, that just broke my heart all over again, why, why did they have to go through, through this, why, I don't, I just can't understand it. It's Maxine Sutcliffe, who I spoke to earlier today, his partner John was shot for no apparent reason in, in Spain some years ago. And Michael, what struck me about that, in, uh, that interview was the tragedy, the utter desperation, the senseless loss of life, and the ripple effect that a death like that has, not just on the immediate family, but it, just, it permeates all the way out. And it's, it's an all too familiar story that, that you're familiar with. I, for my sins, I've spoken to hundreds of people like Maxine, hundreds of mothers, hundreds of fathers, hundreds of widows, and it always strikes me that it's, there's a moment when they realize that their loved one is dead, obviously like Maxine did when she saw him under the sheet. But that moment never goes away. That is their life for the rest of their lives. They never get over it. It's something that is with them when they wake up, and it's something that is with them when they go to bed. It's the, the, the 
ultimate shock because it's so sudden they don't get a chance to say goodbye and it's just with them forever. It's, does it not as well, Neve, have some sort of a, a galvanizing effect on the community? I and mean, we, we saw that in the case of Roy Collins, his mm. father Steve, who took to the streets of Limerick and people in their thousands came out and marched against these criminals, these gun-toting criminals. It, it also has that effect as well. It was something that, that did emerge, particularly uh, in terms of Roy Collins and Shane Gagan, actually, both, both cases. The, the families in their in different ways made very strident efforts to come out and say this is not us this is not what we're about and this is not what limerick is about and this is what not, not what people in limerick are about and one of the best things actually in some ways is that in, in some cases particularly i think in the shane gagan case that was in in many ways kind of a somebody who was outside the disadvantaged communities experiencing something that actually was very familiar to people who lived in the disadvantaged communities and i think it created a space for a lot of other people to say you know i lost my son too and and it actually kind of revealed in some ways the extent of the loss and and the heart uh, and, and it was it was a powerful moment in kind of uniting limerick people i saw john gilligan there at the, at the beginning of the program saying you know this is not what we we're about that's an important moment for communities and really community is the key source of responding to this for people who are living solidarity uniting together you know people coming together and saying we're not going to allow our children to be sucked into that that's an absolutely critical part of any response to gun crime and all the, the range of crimes that we're looking at here which are part of this the drugs issue or would you get the sense that perhaps the public in general are somewhat immune to gun crime, to death, to murder, that it takes so much more to shock them, shock them upright into saying, you know, this is not right, we now need to take some sort of conservative action. And I know the, the last time I saw that happening in this country was the, the murder of Veronica Gear, and I haven't seen anything since then, but yet the crimes have just been appalling. Yeah, yeah I, think, um, I think particularly Melanie's death last week has raised consciousness in people but I think prior to that it's seen as just somebody else out of the way somebody else that's not going to cause problems in this country um, probably they're drug fueled gangs they're, you know they're, there's actually no excuse for them you know kind of but this is not only is one in the community anyhow that I was in today walking around it certainly resonated that they're, they're very very depressed they're but did silent. it resonate, re resonate beyond the community because unless it, that happens it's yeah. just another statistic. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about Beyond the Community. I know until it itself it has resonated in people. And going about my daily business, people have said to me about poor Melanie, 16 years of old, female. Um, she, she's now, you know, been shot, brutally shot dead. I don't know how much it impacts on the rest of the country. I'm not sure about that, whether people have that concern or they're just, given the state of this country, they're really preoccupied with everything else. and. The loss of one girl in Tallow maybe just doesn't seem too significant to them at the moment. I'm, I'm slightly cynical about this. I've covered plenty of turning points. I'll give you three names. Donna Cleary, yeah. Baba Salite yeah. and Anthony Campbell. Mm -hmm. And like Melanie, they were all r innocent people in the wrong place at the wrong time, like uh, she and Gagan. And I thought every one of those murders would be a turning point. There aren't any turning points. In a year's time, we'll be sitting here talking about another innocent person killed because people involved in gang crime don't care. I don't know actually Michael because I think Gavin and Millie in Limerick was a turning point. I think that definitely was. Um, oh, but the other thing I, I think it, and it's very complex for people who are living in the communities and obviously the full investigation into the Melanie McCarthy McNamara uh, murder has to happen yet but in context where you know a feud exists that that creates a very complex dynamic in terms of, of violence and in terms of gun crime and in terms of patterns of tit for tat and retaliation and that's a very special policing challenge and I, I think that in a sense once once people feel that a particular act is part of a feud they kind of say well that's just that problem and it's not normal okay. society but feuding can be can have a very damaging effect on a whole community. Okay well, well looking at um, the turning points as you said Michael perhaps we then need to change the focus of the debate and not look at what has happened at the back end of it but perhaps focus attention on why it begins, how it begins, and what we need to do in order to, to cut, to root out that cancer. Do you not think that? Well, I think we do. I mean, in a sense, it's, it's, it's a dual-pronged approach. Like, there, there's a policing challenge.